Good afternoon. I hope you've been enjoying the day. Um, to the question that Professor Gensler asked, no, he's not fired, and no, he doesn't need to take a tensor algebra class, but we have some available if he might be interested. When we put together this uh, day, it was our hope that we could take learnings from the financial crisis, be able to look back and codify them, and then also to look forward. It was our hope that we could have one particular person close out this day, based on, both based on past experiences and also based on the ability to take those experiences and look ahead, and that's John Thane. As all of you know, John served as co-COO for Goldman Sachs, served as the CEO of New York Stock Exchange, served as chairman and CEO for Merrill Lynch, and then after the crisis, uh, served as chairman and CEO for CIT Group. Uh, there are many other things to say about John. The only other things I'm going to mention right now are his wonderful connections with MIT. Many of you also know that John is a course six bachelor's graduate from MIT. Uh, that means, of course, electrical engineering and computer science. Uh, John is a life member of the MIT Corporation. He serves currently as chair of the visiting committee for the MIT Sloan School of Management. I guess in some sense that he, he's my boss's 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 boss. Um, he also uh, very nicely has agreed uh, to serve on the uh, Schools America's advisory board. Um, and so I look forward very much to offering a couple questions for John before we open it up more broadly. Um, so would you please join me in asking John Thane to um, come up. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> so, John, we've never met. Uh, <laughs> of course not. <laughs> um, actually, I, so a number of the things I want to ask you about um, have come up earlier today. We'll mention those as we uh, go along, including a sense of the future. And we might do a little point counterpoint with your sense of that future in light of what um, Gary just talked about. But I'd like to start with your own personal history, if you don't mind a little bit. Um, you have an extraordinary set of leadership responsibilities from Goldman to um, New York Stock Exchange um, to Merrill Lynch and so on. Even before focusing on the crisis, I'd just like to ask you about those experiences. You learned a lot along the way um, about management and strategy and leadership. Um, can you just share, we don't get a chance to um, ask you these kinds of questions very often, so I'd like to ask you, thinking about that leadership journey, what are some of the things that strike you that you experienced and learned along that path? Sure, well, first of all, thank you for asking me to be here. Um, they're very different because I spent, you know, 25, almost 25 years at Goldman Sachs. I really grew up at Goldman Sachs. And most of the time I was at Goldman Sachs, it was a partnership. And so as I progressed in my career at Goldman, I really did learn about teamwork, because Goldman Sachs as a partnership really emphasized teamwork and working as a team, and the thought was that all of us are collectively smarter than any one of us. We also were very client focused, and, and there was always this uh, question about doing the right thing for the clients, and also always a very uh, questioning about what could you do better. Because if, if you go back, I started at Goldman in 1979. In 1979, Goldman Sachs was not one of the top tier firms. The top tier firms at the time were Morgan Stanley, Whiteweld, and Dylan Reed, which is interesting to see that two out of three are no longer in existence. And so it was a great opportunity to be in a firm that really valued teamwork, really was an, uh, a, a true meritocracy. Uh, was a place where everyone worked together in a cooperative way to do the best thing for our clients and really taught people about how to manage and lead in a very um, cooperative, very, um, very supportive environment. So it was a great place to learn. It, it was a great setup for me because when I went to the New York Stock Exchange, the New York Stock Exchange, we talked about technology, New York Stock Exchange, the day I joined, it took about a minute to execute a trade on the exchange. 
which of course is craziness in today's world where they, you know, it's measured in microseconds now. Um, the exchange was uh, private, it was owned by the seat, uh, seat holders, uh, and it was losing market share rapidly. It hadn't addressed the changing technology. Mm -hmm. What was interesting from a management point of view is I needed to change that institution, but the people that I really needed to work with to change it didn't work for me. Yeah. So I couldn't tell them what to do. Yeah. And so it really was a case where you had to convince the seat holders and you had to con convince that group of people to change an institution that had been kind of moribund for years and years and years. And that was a pretty unusual and unique management challenge. And, and, and that was actually quite fun to be able to get that done. And then, of course, you know, the, the, in the end, the exchange became much more technology uh, focused, much more modern, and much more global. Uh, and then the third one the, at Merrill, which is another uh, very different uh, circumstance, managing in a crisis is just completely different. Because unlike at a place like Goldman Sachs, where you could take the time to build consensus and uh, collect everyone's views and come to a consensus view, uh, or in the New York Stock Exchange where you had to build a consensus, when you're in a crisis, you just don't have time to do that. Mm -hmm. And so you need to make decisions much more quickly. You need to make decisions in a, um, with a much, much less certainty. The data is bad. The world is changing. Everything is different every single hour. And managing in a crisis is a kind of unique uh, type of management style. Yeah. Uh, I prefer not to do that very often, uh, yeah. but at least uh, it is a great learning experience. Um, before moving on, can I just ask, did, did you feel like the New York ex Stock Exchange was in a crisis situation? And did you get that consensus by suggesting it was a crisis, or did you do that in another way? How did you build, how did you get the consensus there? So, so it, it was in a crisis in that it was losing market share quite rapidly uh, and, it, and it, was, it was not going to be able to continue its current form. Yeah. It wasn't quite as time sensitive as the financial crisis was in, in, uh, yeah. the, in my time at Merrill Lynch. But it was convincing them that if they continued on that current path, mm -hmm. you know, they were going to continue to lose market share and you know, eventually they were going to lose the relevance that they had in the marketplace. Now, the other way that I convinced them was that economically, if you, you could buy a seat, on the day I joined the New York Stock Exchange, you could have bought a seat on the exchange for about a million dollars. Mm -hmm. After the combination of the, um, the public offering, which was done through a merger uh, with Archipelago, which brought us the technology, and then mm -hmm. with um, the Euronext transaction, mm -hmm. that million dollars, if you take the cash distribution and the value of the stock, turned into about $8 million. Mm -hmm. So there was also a big economic benefit, which helped. I, I bet. Um, so I want to ask you a question that was asked um, earlier of the panel uh, this afternoon. Um, uh, how did you know? that there was something different coming in the world of finance that started to feel like a financial crisis. There wasn't a term for it then, but when did things start to feel different and, and in what way did it start to feel different as you experienced it? So this is when I was at, at Merrill. Yeah. Uh, well, so I joined Merrill in December of 2007. So Merrill already was in trouble. So Merrill had already reported multi-billion dollar loss. And the C former CEO had gotten fired. And so Merrill itself was in trouble the day I joined. Yes. Um, Merrill, we, as a matter of fact, one of the first things I had to do was raise capital to fill the hole that was created by the, the losses uh, that were there. And you know their balance sheet already had on it uh, billions you know, of uh, mortgage-related assets, billions and billions and billions. So they had $50 billion of uh, ABS CD, uh, CDOs on their balance sheet, just long. Uh, I did ask them, I asked the board when I joined, I said, well, five years ago you didn't own any, today you own 50 billion, why is it okay to own 50 billion of these assets? And, they, and the answer was, well, but they're AAA. I go, well, but they're, these assets are no, nothing like you know, real AAA assets. 
Um, and um, so I, I joined knowing that Merrill was already in trouble. I think what- but, get, uh, Before, I, I don't mean to interrupt, but right. why did you take the job? <laughs> <laughs> so I asked myself that question. <laughs> um, as a matter of fact, I actually said once publicly, which you know probably was a mistake, I, I said, um, because I hated to sell Merrill. Merrill was a great institution with a great history. And I, I said once, if I had known that the outcome was I was going to have to sell it to save it, yeah. I wouldn't have taken the job. Um, I took the job because it was a great institution. It was in a lot of trouble. You know, I, I, I've, I've always said, I like to fix things that someone else broke. Mm -hmm. uh, and that, that was true at CIT as well. Yeah. So the problems at Merrill Lynch existed when I got there. What I didn't realize is what was going to happen over the course of the next you know, nine months. Mm -hmm. Both the decline in asset values and the loss of liquidity in the marketplace, which made it very difficult to fix things fast enough. Yeah. And then of course, the the, the bankruptcy of Lehman Brothers in particular, and the idea that Lehman was allowed to go bankrupt in an uncontrolled way, the consequences to Merrill Lynch of that would have been catastrophic. Uh, and so that weekend, you know, I decided that my job as a CEO was to protect the shareholders and, f and to protect the employees yeah. and negotiate the sale to Bank America. But, but I, I I hated doing that. I had to do it because that's what was necessary, but it was, it was hard to do. Yeah. Um, and um, you know, I, I wish that hadn't been the outcome. If the financial crisis had not gotten as bad as it had, and if Lehman hadn't been allowed to go bankrupt in the way that they did that, you know, Merrill, Merrill could have been fixed. I just needed more time. Yeah. Um, so I know there have been books written about this, but can you talk a little bit about just your mindset and the decision process during, that, during those hours and days to yeah. um, make this decision sure. and do it? Well, first of all, a lot of the books that are written are written so, so that it is history as the person who wrote it wishes it would be remembered. Um, you know, for instance, a, a lot of the commentary about that the, the Fed and the Treasury didn't have the legal basis to rescue Lehman yeah. is complete nonsense. Uh, that was never discussed over the weekend, the legal ability to do it. Yeah. Um, there was a lack of political will to do it, and then, uh, there was, there was uh, I think, a lot of concern about uh, rescuing another Wall Street firm, yeah. but the idea they didn't have the legal right to do it is, is ridiculous. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the real issue was we, Merrill, the whole financial war industry was having a lot of difficulty, asset prices were falling. Um, we were, we, we, Merrill was bleeding cash, but, and all of the investment banks uh, were having cash flow problems. Uh, we knew Lehman was in trouble. I got called to the Fed on that Friday evening. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and Friday night I would have thought that the government, the Treasury and the Fed and, and, the, and the SEC, which were the three main entities there, I, I would have thought that they would come up with a similar solution that came up with the Bear Stearns. Mm -hmm. uh, that would have been a better outcome. Mm -hmm. By midday Saturday, it was clear they were gonna allow Lehman to go bankrupt. They were not gonna engineer that. It wasn't gonna be possible to put together a private sector solution like it was with long-term capital. Yeah. And the consequences in the marketplace of allowing Lehman to go bankrupt in an uncontrolled way were going to be catastrophic. And it was clear to me it was going to be catastrophic. And that means that Merrill would not likely have been able to survive. Yeah. And so my thought process was, I have to prevent that outcome. I do not want to be Lehman the next weekend. Uh, and so I put the phone call in to, to um, to, to Ken uh, at Bank America, and you know we basically created that deal in the next uh, 36 hours. Yeah. Um, were you? Did it ever occur to you that someone else might make that deal with B of A other than, or, or was was this just something that you were unique? That is to say, Merrill was unique, and B of A was unique, and we needed to make this happen. Were there other parties that were also in stress? or that represented opportunities from your perspective? <laughs> well, so, so the answer here, and this has, has been covered in a lot of the books. So yeah. 
everyone was in stress. Yeah. You know, Morgan Stanley was in a yes. lot of stress. Yes. You know, Goldman, I don't know if Armin's still here, Goldman, even though they tried to deny it, was also in a lot of stress. Yeah. Um, the, um, so, so there was a lot of conversations going on about different, converse, about different yes. ways to try to alleviate the this, this yes. stress. Um, the, you know, Bank of America had actually been uh, talking uh, to Lehman Brothers. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, Barclays was also talking to Lehman Brothers. So there were a lot of discussions going back and forth. My perspective was, in the time that we had, yeah. Bank of America was really the only transaction we could get done fast enough yeah. to help. And by the way, that turned out to be true because when we announced the deal with Bank of America, Lehman went bankrupt, you know, AIG had its problems you know, on Tuesday. We were basically protected from all of the negative impact, which then mostly affected Morgan Stanley and Goldman Sachs. Yes. And you know, the cash drains that Morgan Stanley and Goldman Sachs were feeling were continued really until the government put in place the TARP program. Yes. Um did you feel relief after the agreement? I, it was it was a bittersweet thing, you know. First of all, I was giving up my job. Yeah. Second of all, I was selling an institution that's been around for a very long time. Mm -hmm. But it was also rest protecting the institution, protecting the shareholders, and also protecting all the employees. So all the jobs yeah. uh, of those employees were protected. Yeah. Um, so then you were at B of A for a short time, and then... Um, yeah, 21 days. There you go. <laughs> we don't need to say how short, but we can. <laughs> um, uh, and then uh, before the passage of really all that much time, it seems to me, um, uh, and keeping in mind that you said that in, you know, there was the whole, if I had known, I might not have taken the Merrill job, and, mm -hmm. um, you decided to be CEO and chairman of CIT Group, a firm that went bankrupt in November of 2009, as I understand it, mm -hmm. came out of bankruptcy admittedly a month later, but needed some significant work, yes? Uh, yes, so uh, this, this fits in with two things. One I mean, is, I feel one there's it, a pattern here. One, it was, <laughs> it was again, fixing something that someone else broke. I understand. Um, and second of all, when you start with an entity that came out of bankruptcy, it really can't get much worse. <laughs> And so it's got to get better. Um, okay. And it was, also, it was also a very interesting set of businesses, which were not businesses that I had a lot of experience with. So they were a big middle market lender, which was a you know, credit business, which I hadn't really had much experience with. They're a very big aircraft lessor, which is actually quite an interesting business. Yeah. They're a rail car lessor. And then they were the, they still are actually, they were the largest factor in the United States. Hmm. So providing shorter term financing to, to um, companies. <laughs> So the set of businesses were interesting. Um, the whole corporate infrastructure was broken. So the CFO had quit. There was no chief risk officer. There no, was no head of internal audit. So the whole corporate infrastructure had to be rebuilt. And then you know our we the we, we had all kinds of you know regulatory problems. The Fed we had many many issues with the Fed and the, our regulators. And and you know it takes it takes years to fix those regulatory problems, yeah. um, but we did. And you know, by the time I left, uh, we had solved all the regulatory issues and the Fed had actually allowed us to make an acquisition. It was really the first yeah. bigger acquisition after the financial crisis. And the Fed doesn't allow you to do deals unless you are in good standing with them. Um, their businesses actually were all doing fine. And you know, it, it, is, it is sort of fun to, to you know, fix uh, what is fundamentally a good business and a good company, yes. uh, and uh, and leave it in a good shape when you leave. And that was a couple of years ago, yes. Um, yeah. Uh, so if anybody has a broken business, um, somebody <laughs> else is broken. I mean, it feels like time. You know, that um, I don't know. Maybe we'll see. Um, I I, I want to turn to look to now and look mm -hmm. at the future a little bit. Um, and uh, so you are of MIT. Um, it feels like um, it would be nice to hear your thoughts, good to hear your thoughts about the role of technology in finance now and maybe in the time ahead. 
Um, it could be thoughts about you know, the future in fintech, AI, machine learning, and so on. It could be um, uh, other kinds of technology and the way that you see um, both opportunity and maybe disruptive change. Well, first of all, I think Gary did a great job talking about how technology was changing things in a whole bunch of different areas. You know, obviously technology has changed how um, stocks trade, um, and and um, you know the the use of technology inside the uh, financial firms. You know, Goldman Goldman probably hires more engineers and computer scientists and and physicists for that matter. Uh, than they do MBAs these days. Uh, so technology is changing both how the firms manage themselves, how the markets work, uh, and Gary covered all kinds of ways that it's, yeah. it's changing how, uh, changing some of the players in the marketplace. Yeah. You know, I think that's a, you know, that, that has been the case for a long time. As Gary said, the, you know, the evolution of technology and how it changes the marketplace is a, is a continual process. Um, you know, sometimes the technology creates new issues. Mm -hmm. You know, I think some of the uh, computerized trading that occurs in the stock market um, can cause problems, uh, particularly in uh, crises, where mm -hmm. the, uh, the computer-driven trading can actually increase the volatility in the marketplace rather than reduce it, which is what you know, the computer-driven traders would argue it does in normal times, yes. which is probably true. But it certainly increases the the volatility and the swings in a in a difficult times. Yes. Um, how sanguine are you about the resilience of the financial system, looking ahead? Not about technology necessarily. Yeah. Um, there have been changes in rules and regulations. Um, the world is different in some ways, mm -hmm. but maybe not so different in some others. Um, so I like reading Kindleberger's book, you know, and the financial marketplaces have had crises and manias and panics for hundreds of years. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's true recently. So uh, there's nothing that says there won't be another financial crisis. Mm -hmm. uh, as a matter of fact, I think people who say, oh, yes, we've eliminated financial crises are simply wrong. There will be. It'll be different. It won't be the same, but you know, we we whether it's 2008 or 97 or you know we, we go back in time, there will be some new crisis of some kind. I think in today's world, the banks themselves are in much better shape. Mm -hmm. They're much better capitalized. They're all the stress testing. Uh, I would I would guess that the next problem will not come uh, at least in today uh, recently or near term from the banking system. Yeah. However, there's a lot of leverage in the system. It's uh, the, the riskiest leverage is, in, is outside the banking system. Yes. But the BDCs and the hedge funds and, the, and the, the places that are providing that capital or that leverage into the system are not very regulated and not very transparent. And that would certainly be a place I would be concerned as a possible risk. Yeah. Does it concern you very much, uh, the growth in government debt? You could think about um, uh, uh, you know, uh, university uh, loans for tuition. You could, th uh, you could think about the, um, the real estate, um, the, the role or quasi role of the government in real estate lending. Um, is that a concern for you or not very much? There are people who think that that would be a very slow moving crisis if it was a crisis at all. Um, how do you, do you think about that? And so, so, I, so the answer is yes, and and so, you know, government borrowing and the and, you know the the size of the U.S. deficit and the size of the U.S. government uh, debt and the need for the U.S. government to continue to refinance that debt uh, is definitely a concern, but it's it's one of those things that can last for a long time until it until it doesn't. Mm -hmm. And so it could go on for years mm -hmm. and not be a crisis until the day it becomes a crisis. Um, and like an earthquake. Yes, exactly. <laughs> yes. So yes, the, the, ten the tension on the, on the 
plates are still there, right. Right. and you don't really know when it's going to give way. Yes. And, and so I do think it's a concern, but I think it's the kind of concern that can still, the U.S. can continue to, as, particularly as, as the dollar continues to be the world's, the world's reserve currency, I think the U.S. can continue to borrow for a long time. Yeah. Um, so you said that there are likely to be crises of one kind or another in the time ahead. We don't know when. Uh, how would you advise maybe the people in this room uh, to think about the prospect of future crises? And are there things that you would encourage them to think about or do with respect to that kind of future, the uncertainty in that future, the likelihood that there will be difficult times at some time? Do we just, what would be, um, um, one perspective is we'll wait till it happens and then, you know, we'll deal with it then. Are there things that you think people should do now? Well, it's always better if you can either try to prevent the crisis or to prevent the crisis from being as big as it was in 2008. And so I, I, I think there definitely are things that, you know, can be done. You know, every, every individual person is a little bit dependent on, you know, where they sit. And, and you, know, um, you know, I think that the, most of the financial crises st still have, have some degree of causa causality it, with leverage. Yeah. And so um, being concerned about being over, if you go back to 2008, you know, the consumers were over levered, the financial firms were over levered, the deals themselves were over levered. Mm -hmm. uh, certainly the, the mortgage market and the leverage that was available for housing was excessive. And so limiting your exposure to over levered situations is one way to protect yourself. Yeah. Um, liquidity is the other place that, that that people get in, financial firms get into trouble. You know, most financial firms get into trouble not because they run out of capital, but because they run out of liquidity. Yes. And so having, having a lot of liquidity, now one of the problems with that is what does a lot mean? And, you know, when you're chewing through, you know, billions of dollars a day, you know, a, a lot can, means really a lot. Yeah. So having a lot of liquidity is important. And then, you know, if you look back to the, to, Look back to long-term capital as an example. You know, not being too big uh, is also important. So, you know, long-term capital. One of their big problems was they were very levered, but they were also just too big. Mm -hmm. For their their trade positions were too big. Yeah. Um, and so, leverage, liquidity, and kind of size versus the marketplace are probably the three areas I would watch. Thank you. That's good. So, um, let's say you had a son or niece or nephew who was interested in finance, would you encourage them to go into finance <laughs> looking uh, at this future? So first of all, I, I don't know if my son's actually yeah, is your here. Son here. My son, <laughs> we my, might son was, my son was invited. I don't know if he's actually here. Oh, he is here. <laughs> so hypothetically, <laughs> I, I, um, I told all of my children yeah. they should not go into the financial world. They're all in the financial world. Nice. <laughs> so uh, maybe we should bring them. Uh, three, three, <laughs> three of them work for hedge funds. Yes. Uh, although one is actually changing into a, a private firm, but um, and and so they're all in the financial world. Um, you know, look, I think there continue to be uh, great opportunities in the world of finance. Um, you know, it's. You kind of go back. I don't think it's any different today than it was when I joined. So, you know, I grew up in a small town in the Midwest. I never heard of Goldman Sachs. I had never heard of, you know, I didn't. I knew nothing about the financial world. Uh, I was an EECS major. That didn't teach me anything about finance. I didn't take any courses at Sloan. Yes. Um, I went to Harvard Business School, yes. uh, and I took a job at Goldman. Because, not because I knew anything about it, but because it was interesting. It had interesting people. Mm -hmm. It seemed challenging, yeah. uh, and and it seemed like it was fun. And so the fact that it's a challenging place to work, and that it's they work on complex problems, and and the fact that uh, mm -hmm. you know there's a lot of smart people that work there, I think is still true. Yes. Um, and, you know, look, in the, in the end, I think people forget about the fact that the capital markets provide capital to companies 
that employ people and build things and for the most part, you know, make the world a better place. Yeah. And if we didn't have functioning capital markets, you know, everyone would be worse off. Yes. So that um, uh, takes me back. If the last thing I'd like to ask you about um, has a little connection with what uh, Leonid Kogan was talking about earlier today, um, the investment that MIT makes in finance. And um, we believe, we know that finance is important. We know that the right kind of finance um, is uh, needed and needs to continue to improve. Um, we think that MIT has a special role to play in that way. So I just want to ask you, you could talk about finance or you could talk more generally because your connections to MIT are broad. But on its good days, on its best days, what, what is MIT? What should MIT be? Well, so first of all, MIT has really smart people. And you know, providing, having really smart people look at some of the world's most important problems is a great thing. That's true not just for Sloan, but that's true for all of MIT. Yeah. And so I think focusing, uh, having that level of intellect focused on you know, the financial world, but also the world's, the world's biggest problems is, is a really important thing. I think the other thing, though, that MIT teaches is it, it, it teaches people, and this is true, I think, of Sloan as, as well as MIT, it, it teaches people to ask questions and to kind of, to not just accept yeah. kind of whatever the, the belief of the day. And I'll just give you one example. Mm -hmm. This is in the, in the mortgage market, you know, in, in 2008. So one of the, one of the variables when you put it, when you're trying to value a mortgage security, mm -hmm. it was called HPA, which was home price appreciation. Right. So the model that people were using didn't allow you to put in a negative number. <laughs> so the idea that house prices only go up, you know, is, is a crazy idea today, but it wasn't then. Yes. And so teaching people to question the status quo, keep, keep having people have the intellectual kind of boundary to say, you know what, I'm going to think a little out of the box. What happens if home prices really went down? You know, what does that do? That, I think that's a great thing to, to teach the students don't just accept whatever the mantra is at the moment. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, maybe this is a good time. We said we would protect some time for questions. Um, and um, Great. Uh, can I take this moment also to, um, on behalf of all of us, um, uh, Heidi and um, Kelly, thank you so much for managing the day and for managing the Q&A so well. I really appreciate it. Thank you for everyone's great questions. So, okay, the first question is, in February of this year, Bank of America announced that they would shift away from using the Merrill, using Merrill Lynch in its branding. Do you have any thoughts on the phase out of the legacy of Merrill Lynch? Well, first of all, I'm not sure they're really gonna do that. Um, they, um, they cert when, when, Bank of America bought Merrill. I think they, un they didn't appreciate the strength of the Merrill Lynch brand. Um, my credit card still has a bull on it. Uh, and so I, 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 think, um, I, I think it's likely they will continue to use uh, Merrill or Merrill Lynch, uh, particularly on the wealth management side. Um, you know, I, I, I think it would be to, to not use such a strong brand, I think would be a mistake. Can you please compare and contrast the role of risk management in financial corporations before and after the financial crisis? Well, there's no question that uh, risk management, um, it, you know, the need for risk management uh, is, um, has improved and, and has been strengthened. Um, I think that the, the biggest thing issue was not the firms didn't have risk management, it's just that they, they became complacent in the fact that asset prices would continue to rise. And, and you know, you had, and which is again, goes back to this HPA, you know, you had 50 years of home prices going up uh, for the most part. And um, I think the risk management that um, that doesn't just rely on historical data is really, really important. So, you know, using, VA, uh, using VAR 
you know, is, is basically uh, relying on the fact that the world will continue to look in the future as it did in the past, and that's clearly wrong. And 2008 pointed that out, although there were certainly plenty of examples of that in the past. You know, the, the Thai bot looked totally uh, safe to have giant Thai bot positions until the day they, they, they devalued it. Uh, and um, the ability to come up with the questions about what if that are out of the box and are not what, the, what, not what has happened in the past and focusing your risk management on that kind of question, I think, is one of the important differences. Thank you. What was the business rationale for the IndyMac acquisition? Uh, OK, well, so it wasn't called IndyMac at the time, but um, it was called One West. Um, sure, so as, as we were fixing CIT's, all of its different problems, uh, one of the things that CIT didn't have was retail deposits. And no matter how much I argued that, it, that if I have a five-year CD, it can't go anywhere for five years, the Fed in particular believed that retail deposits were the most stable form of deposits. And to get out of all of the regulatory issues, we had to have a more balanced mix of uh, CDs and, and retail deposits. And so the One West transaction, which was the old IndyMac, gave us a base of uh, retail deposits that you know, basically gave us a more diversified funding source. And it actually was the last piece that allowed us to get out of the last little bit of regular, regulatory constraints. Do you have any thoughts about why there are so few women in the higher levels of finance or any ideas on how we can change that? Well, uh, that's a, it, that has been a problem for a long time. Uh, when I was at Goldman, we were very active in trying to um, make the firm uh, more diverse. Uh, not, ju not just with women, but also with underrepresented minorities. Um, the, if you look at the incoming classes, they actually are more diverse, but as you get more and more senior, the percentage of women falls away. Um, I don't think anyone has really totally solved that problem. Um, I, I don't know what the answer is. I know it is a problem. Um, if you're gonna, if you, or if you're gonna have the smartest, most talented people, uh, you have to have uh, a diverse uh, senior management team as well as uh, diverse at the more junior levels. And I think that's just something that we have to continue to work on. Um, it's, not, it's not a problem that I, that I could say, gee, I know, I know it is a problem. It's not a problem I can say. I know what, exactly what to do about it. There is a new generation of employees working on Wall Street and finance that were not in the workforce at the time of the crash, so they lack the experience of dealing with a crisis of that nature. What type of risk could that pose to the future of finance? Hmm. Yeah, so sometimes that's the argument about why these financial crises keep happening, <laughs> uh, is that uh, the people who had the experience from the last one are no longer there. Um, it, you know, it, it, there's nothing that you learn more from than being there you know, when, when the building is burning and, and figuring out what to do. Uh, you know, it, it is, I think it's a, it's a problem. Um, when you haven't gone through a crisis, it's just not the same. And you know, hopefully, the firms will keep at least enough of their senior people around that will have that experience. But in, you learn a lot in a, in a crisis, and if you haven't gone through one, you just don't have that experience. Um, again, I, a lot of people say that's actually why, if you look at the average cycle time for a crisis, it's, a, it's about 10 years. And um, you know, that's kind of a, the life cycle of a lot of the employees. So mm -hmm. um, it's, it's another reason why thinking that crisis will never happen again is just wrong. <clears throat> Does that mean it's time for the earthquake? Is that well, actually, we've this is we, we've gone a long time. Actually, um, I right. but but actually, uh, there's a, there's a lot of work that's been done that when you have a very large crisis, then the recovery also takes longer, 
And you know that uh, I think we're seeing that now. So that the the fact that it's the size of the 2008 crisis is such that the fact it's you know it's taken longer to kind of get back to yeah. normal, whatever normal is, but then also that we haven't had another crisis. You know, I think it's probably the case that you know it's, it's still a while coming, but I I I firmly believe there will be another one. Thank you. How different would your life be if the government saved Lehman and dumped AIG? <laughs> well, that, so that's a really hard question to answer because I don't know exactly what would have happened. Um, I think allowing Lehman to go bankrupt in an uncontrolled way was the biggest mistake of the financial crisis because that is what triggered the complete freezing up of the capital markets and the, and the uncertainty about you know, who was gonna be next. Um, so, and by the way, it doesn't mean that Lehman, ha Lehman had to be rescued in some way, even though it probably would have been better if they'd done a Bear Stearns type of situation with them. Uh, but even, even Drexel, when it went bankrupt, mm -hmm. It was done in a controlled way. Now, Drexel was a lot smaller, a lot less interconnected at the time, but it it was done in a way that it that it it wasn't just it went bankrupt and kind of everything everyone you know goes on their own way. Um, doing something with Lehman and then allowing AIG to go bankrupt would have also been bad. Uh, so I would argue that it would have been better to do some form of control bankruptcy and or some controlled workout for both of them. Um, I think if that had been done, well, I'm, I'm sure if Lehman had not go bankrupt, and I didn't really know AIG's trouble at the time, I would not have sold Merrill to Bank America. Uh, whether or not that would have been a good thing or a bad thing is hard to know for sure. Um, but I do think that if Lehman had not gone, if Lehman had been in a, done in a controlled way and AIG had been done in a controlled way, the severity of the market collapse and the market, the credit freeze that happened would have been less. It doesn't mean we still wouldn't have had a crisis, but it would have been, it would, I think, have been more controlled. But no one really knows. Would you consider coming out of retirement if the right CEO or leadership opportunity presented itself? <laughs> no. <laughs> Then final question, what's on your mind these days? Well, two different things. Um, one is I have six grandkids, so I like to spend time with them, which is why my answer to the first, that prior question was no. Um, and I'm on the board of Uber, which has been keeping me busy recently, as you can imagine. And I'm on the board of Deutsche Bank, which has been keeping me even more busy. <laughs> Uh, so those two things are plenty for right now to, uh, to keep me busy and, and, uh, and, uh, and active. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This is amazing. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Yeah.